So I'll make a start in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think I'll I think I'll make a start now and see any other folks out there. So this tutorial kind of follows on from this morning's one looking at um, Internet Exchange Point design. So this morning we covered BGP, multi-homing. We kind of wandered into a few of the Exchange Point topics as well when we we're talking about uh, peering and transit and so forth. Um, so I know I preempted it a little bit um, on the side, but... <coughs> um, We'll spend quite a bit of detailed time having a look at, again, what are probably the common good practices for um, Internet exchange points and, and so forth. So the slides are, um, I did check this time, <laughs> they are on the MENOG 13 website. If you go into the presentations link, um, they actually are there. And I've also got them on my own repository. Um, if you want to grab them from there as well. So what I'm going to cover, um, I mean, like this morning, we can, we can um, just, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask the questions as, as we're going through it. Um, I am webcasting it. Well, I'm trying to, I'm experimenting with webcasting this. So if, if you have any questions, I'll either repeat them or in the answer, I'll, I'll repeat your question so that the folks on the recording can, and the webcast can see it or hear it. So what I'm going to cover is basically all of this. Um, give a bit of the background, so a bit of the history, uh, why an Internet Exchange Point is important, and we'll spend a lot of time looking at what a Layer 2 Exchange is. Uh, I've got one side and what slide on what a Layer 3 is, um, just to put, what that, I put that in for completeness. Um, look at design considerations, then we'll look at route collectors and route servers. Then we'll finish off by looking at some of the things that, some of the things that go wrong. Not go wrong as much technically as go wrong operationally or politically or, or functionally. Um, and so we'll, we'll cover that as we come through. But in fact, a lot of what can go wrong here is, is covered as we, as we go through the, the tutorial. Right, so let's look at the history first. Um, where did the exchange point concept come from? Um, I mean, it wasn't like we suddenly decided that when the internet started, oh, we need exchange points. There certainly was no uh, thing like that at all. The actual history is a bit more interesting. Um, the very early internet, as you probably know, wasn't an internet. It wasn't a public network. It was actually 
a research network funded by the US National Science Foundation. Um, and the idea really was connecting universities together. I mean, the history of the internet precedes all that. But the first real idea of a network to connect the science and education and research activities in the US was this NSFNet, uh, funded by the US National Science uh, Foundation. And it connected the academic and research institutions. Um, so that meant universities, colleges, and the research institutions could share data over this very, very early IP-based network. Um, it also connected private company networks. Um, I mean, it wasn't just for the universities, for the researchers. Uh, private companies could connect, but they had to abide by this acceptable use policy that the NSF net had. And the acceptable use was basically no commercial activity was permitted. And again, I remember my early internet days, you know, we had to, you know, we're connecting customers to our backbone, but we couldn't give them all the routes. What we had to do was get them to sign what the NSF net's acceptable use policy before we could announce their address space to the NSF net. Um, and, you know, some, some of our customers said that they couldn't guarantee that the, well, the work that they were doing was not commercially based, so we couldn't give them access to the NSF net. Um, and that was a lot of interesting stuff in itself. There were these net three network access points, which were called NAPs, and they were in Chicago, New York, and San Francisco. And this was really where um, folks could connect to the NSF net. I mean, we, we connected, well, we actually connected in Washington, so I don't know how that fitted in. There was probably a fourth access point that hooked into New York. Um, but that's how we got access to the NSF net. Um, so it was purely for academic research use. But the first thing you'll note here is this NAP word, which uh, pops up quite a bit later on, this network access point. Now also what happened was private companies needed to connect their networks because this, of this acceptable use issue. You couldn't, you couldn't use the NSF net to come in at New York and come out at San Francisco with commercial traffic. So that was a bit of a problem. And so that really resulted in some of the early network operators, commercial operators like UUNet and Sprint, who provided connectivity from East Coast to West Coast in the US. Um, so you couldn't cross the NSF net, and so these folks needed the transit across the US. They also couldn't cross the NSF net locally. You couldn't connect to the Chicago NAP, for example, and peer with another commercial provider. You were, you were literally connecting to the academic backbone. So you couldn't use that academic backbone to connect to the two providers. So this resulted in the early commercial internet exchanges. In fact, they were called that. You had the commercial internet exchange called Kix, and that was in um, the West Coast in San Francisco. Um, so these were the early exchanges created in the very early 90s. We had Kix West, West Coast US. It was May East. Um, I mean, May stands for Metropolitan Area Exchange, and that was an East Coast in um, North Virginia, Washington, give or take. I mean, it was a few miles from Washington. And um, there was one in Europe, the DGIX um, in Stockholm, where some of the operators interconnected there rather than heading all the way to the US and back. And so those were the first ones. Um, there was the end of the NSF net in 1995, which meant the move towards commercial internet. Private companies started selling their bandwidth. ANS, the operator of the NSF net, they were the last operator of it. They were kind of forced to join the IXs. Um, I mean, previously we had UUNet, Sprint, PSI, and a few others who provided the, the the backbone and ANS were kind of, well, we're just running academic, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do anything. And they more or less were forced to connect to the IXs as well because the academic internet in the US was separating from the commercial. And so US universities getting access to the commercial world were going some really strange places um, just to get the connections. Rapid writing arbiter project, um, you probably, well, I mean, that's initialed RA. I mean, you've probably heard of RADB, 
Well, guess what that is? The RADB is the remnants of this Routing Arbiter project. RADB stands for Routing Arbiter Database. And the idea was to store in this database the routing information, the, the policy information that ISP used to interconnect with each other. So a bit more history. Um, the NAPs established late in the NSFNet life were some of the original exchange points. They weren't really an exchange, but it's where the operators could connect to each other to connect to the academic network. So they, were, they looked like the early exchanges. So we had Sprint in New York, PacBell in San Francisco, Ameritech in Chicago, MFS NAP, the Vienna one, was very, very late on. MFS, Metropolitan Fiber Systems, was bought by, no, hang about it, they bought UUNet, and then they were all bought by WorldCom. I'm sure there was something else in the middle. MCI was in there as well at some point. Right, so that was the most recent one. The NAPs were very quickly replaced by internet exchanges because the NAPs were bought to get access to the academic network. Um, because Another reason they didn't succeed is because they're operated by ISPs. I mean, Sprint, big ISP in the US. Pac Bell, Pacific Bell, West Coast US, big ISP. Ameritech, big, big network operator. MFS became UUNet, became MCI. Um, big, big ISP. So an ISP running an exchange point does not work. I mean, this was the first lesson. And it's amazing how many ISPs think after all these years that they can set up an internet exchange and somehow have it work is, you know, history has already dictated it doesn't work, it cannot work, yet there's still ISPs who try and do this. Right, so what happened was Virginia NAP was ended up being replaced by, by May East and so forth. So, and May East became a neutral exchange point. UUNet had to separate it from their commercial business. Mid-90s, rapid internet growth, major providers started connecting to these. Moving into Europe, um, well, DGIX formed in Stockholm. It was the first European exchange point in 1992. The three Swedish ISPs connected there. Um, and they get massive latency reduction. They no longer had to transit their traffic via the US or other places. And they got big performance gains. And the Swedish internet has really been, ever since, one of the foremost points of or most developed parts of the European internet. I think it's a lot to do with some of the personalities that um, were working in the early days and were pretty much still around even now uh, in, in the network operations. The next exchange, I mean, I mentioned this on Sunday, uh, the next exchange was uh, Lynx in London. Um, we saw the success of the DGIX, and we saw how May East was working. We saw how Kix was totally broken on the west coast of the US. Um, and none of us, as the operators in the UK, liked our traffic going via the US just for uh, local connections. So the five UK operators interconnected, big latency reduction, local traffic stayed local. So the whole reasoning for why an exchange point is necessary, the latency reduction, the performance gains, and local traffic staying local, um, that forms the basis of the IX. In Asia, HKIX in Hong Kong, that was the first Asian exchange point in 1995. There are many small ISPs in Hong Kong. Um, they're not the big operators that we're normally accustomed to. They're very much internet cafes, small um, um, local area ISPs, they all connected to the HKIX. This was run by the University of Hong Kong. So again, it was an independent, neutral, or the Chinese University of Hong Kong, independent, neutral organization. Again, not run by any ISP. So DGIX, neutral. Um, the exchange point in Sweden is now run by NetNod, um, and they run also run iRoot and so forth. So it's another not-for-profit organization. Lynx has its own organization management structure, not-for-profit um, organization, HKX also. And then, you know, with other Euro European exchanges appearing after that, AMP6 in Amsterdam a bit later, uh, DKIX in Germany and Frankfurt a bit later, and so on. And so the IXs in Europe really started appearing. And I think now it's safe to say it, each European country has at least one internet exchange point. Um, so what is it? Neutral location where network operators freely interconnect their networks to exchange traffic. That's the definition. Um, neutral is very, very important. I mean, we saw in the very early internet that 
a non-neutral IX would not succeed. So the early NAPs didn't succeed because they were run by ISPs. And you know, many ISPs in many parts of the world try running IXs and don't understand why they don't work. Well, you know, neutrality is very important. You have to remember that ISPs are competing with each other all the time. So any perception of commercial advantage is immediately avoided by the, the competition. So neutrality is important. Um, and we freely interconnect the networks. Um, that's very important as well. There shouldn't be any barrier to entry. There shouldn't be any barrier to who can peer with whom. Um, and again, where barriers have been put in place, the IXs have failed. Um, links came very close to failing. We had barrier to entry. We, the, the first five ISPs set a really high membership fee, £10,000 a year. And the, anybody who wanted to join had to prove they had their own independent international bandwidth to the US. And that's what it said in the bylaws, the rules. You will have your own circuit to the US. Because buying a circuit to the US in those days would cost several hundred thousand pounds, even for a 64K link. And so you had to have serious means before you could become a Lynx member. And of course, you had to have an AS number in your own address space. Um, Lynx had to get rid of those rules because the UK telecoms regulators started getting interested because a supposed neutral interconnect couldn't have barriers to entry. So those rules eventually disappeared, which was just as well. So freely interconnect the networks to exchange traffic. The physical IX is really nothing more than an Ethernet switch. That's all it is. And you know, we can go to some of the smallest countries of the world. Eight port Ethernet switch is, is the IX. There may be a three or four ISPs, and they plug into an eight port Ethernet switch. Manage switch, and that's all they need to do. Certainly, you know, over the last 15 years or so, certainly when I was working at Cisco, doing this presentation, I'd say, if you want to set up an IX, I'll give you an Ethernet switch. I mean, the switch was the least of the problems. I, you know, working at a vendor, you could go and pick them out of a lab because people buy a switch for a particular project, project finished, the switch goes into the, into the bin. And it's like, I spend a lot of time going through bins at Cisco, <laughs> rescuing perfectly good Ethernet switches to help set up IXs and other things. So this is the easiest part to do. How they generally work, the exchange port operator provides the switch and the rack space. Network operators bring the routers, interconnect them via the IX fabric. It is no harder than bringing your router and plugging it into the Ethernet switch. So it is really, really simple. So technically getting the IX set up has been very, very easy. Um, politically getting an IX set up is probably one of the hardest jobs around because you're trying to get network operators who compete severely and viciously with each other to actually appear in the same room and plug the networks in together. There are two exchanges. It, these days, is Ethernet. So all the way from 100 gig, which you're starting to see at the likes of Lynx, M6, DKIX, and so forth. The biggest switches are gig Ethernet, or 100 gig Ethernet. Really down to 100 megabits. I mean, you're spending a couple of hundred dollars now to get a 100 megabit switch. Um, and I've been looking at buying a gigabit Ethernet switch for home, and it's, I look on eBay, $200 for an 8-port uh, gigabit Ethernet switch, managed switch. So th the infrastructure is never really the, the problem. All the technologies like these have been used. I mean, the, the May, May East was ATM for a while. So you'd get an ATM interface on your router, and what they would do is rather than an Ethernet switch, it was an ATM switch, and they gave you an ATM VC to everybody you wanted to peer with. If you want to set up a new peer, it was a new ATM VC. And you had this really am amazing configuration management interface where you could log in and pick who you peer with, and it would set up VCs and so forth. That was a bit over the top. Um, Frame Relay has been used, Frame Relay Cloud. SRP, Spatial Reuse Protocol, that was a Cisco protocol that replaced FIDI. So it's a bit like FIDI, but it used Sonnet instead. So it could run 2.5 gigabits per second. FIDI was that old 100 megabit ring technology used in the 90s. Um, certainly, May East for many years was um, based on a DEC giga switch, which was a FIDI switch. I mean, it started off being a FIDI ring. The problem is, if you want to add somebody, you have to break the ring. So that didn't go very well. And anyway, when FIDI gets to 80 meg, it stops working. I mean, it's no graceful degradation. It literally, bang, stops. 
um, so that FIDI switch came into being. So DEC, digital equipment, had all these giga switches, which formed the core of several internet exchange points around the world for several years. SMDS was used, I mean, kicks west when the router gave up, and they moved over to using SMDS, switched multi-megabit data service. I think it ran about 30 megabits per second, something like that. That was what you could get out of it. That's what Kix um, used for a while. Layer 3 Exchange, there only really was one ever in history, and that was Kix West. They had a Cisco 7010, if you remember your old Cisco routers, which is like, what was it? Uh, I think it was a three or four slot, um, but this tall, Cisco 7000, but it was half, half size with horizontal line cards. Um, Motorola 6820 processor, um, 60 meg of RAM max, I think, or maybe it could go up to 64 by the end of it. But yeah, not very impressive, but it was a router. The thing is, somebody had to run it, and so each member of Kix took turns. Every six months, they would take turns in, in running the router. That's, at least that's what it seemed to be. Um, but the router was very quickly overwhelmed by the rapid growth of the internet. I mean, the, the switching throughput of a router was nothing compared with what an Ethernet switch could do. So layer three is gone and it's history. You know, every now and then you get people today saying, oh yeah, I'll set up an uh, internet exchange point with my Cisco or my big Juniper box. But again, the cost of a big router you need to do this compared with getting a an Ethernet switch that can switch packets at that kind of speed. You're looking like many, many orders of magnitude different in price. And the router's still not as fast or as flexible. And anyway, somebody has to operate the router, Ethernet switch, switch it on, and forget it. So why do we do an exchange point? Um, saving money, improving QoS, and generating the local internet economy. Those are really the three reasons. So if you consider a reason without, sorry, with just one ISP, they've got the monopoly, they provide internet connectivity to the customers, they've got one or two international connections, all good. What happens when another ISP arrives? They do the same thing. How does traffic from one ISP get to the other one? It goes over their international connections. Now, if this is satellite, it becomes really, really slow. So it goes over their international connection. So satellite, 550 milliseconds per hop, round trip time. So local traffic can take over one second. So there's not much incentive for, say, content providers to host traffic locally. Um, you know, on Sunday, I, I was going to talk about, well, one classic example was the Nepal Internet Exchange Point. The ISPs there all had the satellite links, but none of them connected locally. So when, for example, something was published locally, maybe the Nepalese newspapers started to use the internet, they hosted them all in the US, because the US was one hop by satellite. And so what happened is, with no peering between the ISPs, they got rid of all of the domestic internet industry, content generation industry, it all moved to the US, because that was the easiest place, the lowest round trip time. If they hosted on one ISP, a competing ISP, it would be hopped to the US and then back to Nepal, hopped to the US, back to Nepal, just to get a page. And that was just way too much hassle, way too slow. And of course, international bandwidth costs significantly more than domestic bandwidth. In most countries, domestic bandwidth is basically free. Um, many countries, you can run fiber anywhere, you can put up microwave point-to-point -point links anywhere or other radio, or WiMAX, or whatever you want to use, without really too much uh, hassle or trouble. So international bandwidth though is very, very expensive because you're crossing other jurisdictions. And you really don't want it to be congested with local traffic. Um, so it wastes an awful lot of money trying to send domestic traffic over your international links. So the solution, from the technical point of view, is the two competing ISPs peer with each other. And this is the hardest bit of any activity of setting up peering. Peering between competitors seems a total anathema, at least to the business people. Um, and it is. I mean, you don't get, co you don't get co competitors cooperating in any other industry in the world. But for the internet to function, which is why we have the internet we have today, it has all happened because competitors cooperate with each other and peer with each other. Because the result is the benefits are for all of them. Everybody who peers save money. 
local traffic stays local, the better network performance, because local bandwidth is unlimited, you can do whatever you want. Um, you can move any data you want around. You don't need to worry about QoS because you can throw bandwidth at the problem. So you don't need to worry about international QoS and rate limiting and all these other things. You literally throw bandwidth at the problem. And so you end up having more international bandwidth for your expensive international traffic, removing the local traffic off your international links, frees up the international links for more traffic. You're not going to reduce your international bandwidth, no way. You may get a, a, a reduction one day, but then once your users realize that, wow, internet is fast for international, they start using it more. Okay, so you're not going to save bandwidth, you're just going to have more international capacity available. If a third ISP enters the equation, same thing. You know, they become a player in the region, local international traffic goes over international connections, they need to peer with the other two ISPs as well. Again, that's politically difficult because the two incumbents go, well, you know, we're not letting a third competitor in, but unfortunately it, it has to be like that um, for the same reason, saving money, keeping local traffic local, improving network performance for all of them. If the new coming ISP lands major customers with major content, the other two are going to be at a big disadvantage, and so on and so on. Now, private peering means that the three ISPs have to buy circuits between each other, which works fine for three because you have a triangle. Right? A triangle uh, means that each provider has had to buy um, two half circuits, so one whole circuit. But as soon as the fourth ISP comes in, you're now buying three half circuits to get to each one. And three half circuits that's one and a half full circuit, which is more expensive than just buying one connection to one internet exchange point. And of course, going to an internet exchange point, you just need one interface, whereas going to three other ISPs, you need three interfaces, so it costs real estate on the router as well. So once you find that there's at least three ISPs in the location, it makes very, very good sense to get an IXP going because it helps reduce the connectivity costs that they have between each other. Um, so every participant has to buy just one whole circuit from their premises to the IXP. So if they can lay fiber on the ground, easy, they lay fiber. If they can use a microwave link or WiMAX link, they can just do that, whatever. So five ISPs have to buy four half circuits to connect to each other, that's two whole circuits, already twice the cost of the IXP connection before you even look at interfaces. Right, so every ISP participates in the exchange point. The cost is minimal. One local circuit covers all domestic traffic. International circuits are used for just international uh, traffic and backing up of the domestic links should the exchange point fail. And of course, the thing is that the exchange point has more operators connecting. You have less and less desire for that exchange to actually fail for any reason. Um, so the exchange point becomes quite central and quite important for the internet infrastructure and the local economy. Result, local traffic stays local, QoS considerations you don't need to worry about, RTTs a milliseconds or whatever. Customers enjoy the internet experience, local internet economy grows rapidly. And what you find is that typically the content providers repatriate their content. You get major data centers and so forth, folks like Google, the root name servers, Akamai, all want to be at exchange points because that gives them the best performance, the best access from, well, their customers, which are your customers, and um, the, their, their content. Right, so you're very much enabling the content by participating in the IX. So here we go, layer two exchange looks something like this, as I mentioned before. It's Ethernet switch is the interconnection media. Um, so the exchange point is just a simple Ethernet LAN. Each ISP brings a router, connects it to the switch, and then you peer with other participants using BGP. Now, it depends on the, on the peering policies, of course. As mentioned before lunch, you, know, you can have open peering, you can have partial peering, and you can have closed peering. You know, open peering means you peer with anybody. Partial means you are selective, means you pick and choose. Closed means you peer with only the people you want to, and it's top secret who you do peer with. Um, but that's fine. That's very, very typical of what, what happens. So each ISP will peer with the other participants. 
And scaling this concept, of course, is the challenge. I mean, we've we heard from D Kicks this uh, this week um, here at Minoc. You know, they run very very big exchange uh, fabric in in Frankfurt, and that's a very very big exchange point. Not really the model for somebody who's starting off an exchange point anyway, because it's a massive an undertaking. Like um, M6 in Amsterdam and Lynx in London, very, very big exchanges. But, you know, physically it looks something like this. Ethernet switch here, ISPs bring the routers, you have a management network in the exchange point, so they, you know, it could be, you know, you probably provide out-of-band access, you probably provide a website so that looks at the statistics here, so the members can get access like a member portal. Um, you probably want another website that advertises the exchange point's existence and who the members are and so forth. You need to do the marketing for the exchange. You increase awareness to try and attract more local providers to come there. And you get a lot of the services as well. You know, you get another LAN with all the services. Root name servers, very popular location. Um, for, well, very popular location as an exchange point for the root name servers because, again, you're minimizing the round trip time between the root name server and the, the users who, who, who would use it. Quite often you get routing registry there. Some IXs run a routing registry. So rather than the ISPs emailing each other with routing updates, um, they put it in the routing registry uh, for members to use. Looking glasses are very common as well. Um, you notice many of the exchange points operate a looking glass. What that is, you can log into that looking glass, whether it's a router or a website, and you can do show IP BGP commands and trace route commands and so forth to help troubleshoot connectivity issues. Of course, as the IX grows, you want to put in two switches. This is quite common. Put them in different racks, different power sources, maybe in different rooms. Or you go like Lynx, M6, d -Kicks have done different buildings, different part of the city. Um, you know, the Japanese ones as well, they're in different parts of the city. They have two points of presence, one switch in one, one switch in the other. <coughs> and that's again just for the whole redundancy bit. ISPs would bring a couple of routers. One goes to one switch, the other one goes into the other switch. And you have a high-speed trunk between the, the two switches. This is very common as well. So the two switches are there for redundancy. ISPs use dual routers for redundancy and for load sharing as well. You know, maybe you have a two one gig links, but you've got probably one and a half gig of traffic, so you can balance the traffic over the two routers onto the, onto the switch. And you, the exchange would offer services for the common good. So the operator of the exchange, which is generally a consortium of the membership of the exchange, um, internet portals, search engines, DNS root TLDs, time servers. You can buy a GPS receiver or atomic clock, put it into the exchange and provide a very accurate time reference for people. Routing registry, looking glass I mentioned. I'll cover these in more detail. Where it can be has to be a neutral location so that anyone can install fiber or other connectivity media to access the exchange point and without cost or regulations imposed by the location. I mean, I'm going through with some colleagues about getting an exchange point set up in Thailand at the moment. And, you know, the neutral location is quite, quite a big issue. You know, one of the biggest providers in Thailand says, well, you can use one floor of our building. We'll declare it neutral. And everybody else said, so how much does it cost to get in there? I, I assume it's free. Oh, no, 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 we have to charge you this and charge you that and charge you for everything else, and you can only get in this time of the day and this and so on not neutral. You need to be able to put anything in at any time of day or night. So data centers are very, very popular. Neutral, independent, operated data centers are very popular. I mean, for example, Equinix run a lot of data centers, and if you find a lot of exchanges are positioned in their data centers. That's one example. I mean, there are other data center operators also. But the main thing is that without cost or regulations imposed by the location. So choosing the location is interesting. Um, you know, quite a few IXs have ended up in universities. Um, universities sometimes can be okay. Um, it just depends on the access, the power they have. You know, some universities have signed exclusive deals with one telco for fiber access. So if another one wants to come in and put fiber, they're stuck. So that doesn't really make it neutral. And that was one of the problems that the Singapore Open Exchange ran into. The exchange was open, but you couldn't get to it um, because you could only buy fiber from one operator. 
that one operator didn't like the open exchange, so they made the prices ridiculous. Secure location, this is really important. You need thorough security like any network data center. You don't want to be like the exchange pond in Uganda was a few years ago when I saw it, which was under a stairs with a door hanging off in some building or other. I mean, it literally was quite, I couldn't believe that, that was actually exchange. You don't want it to be like May East. May East, they used the cleaner's cupboard in a car park opposite the MFS building in Falls Church, Virginia. And I couldn't believe it. I went into the MFS data center. I was visiting my router in May East, went into the data center. Oh, yeah, can I get the key to the rack? And they looked at me very strangely. And they gave me just a standard, um, you know, the standard chub type key that just goes into a standard lock, not the modest other one. And they said, you need to go across the road. And I was like, where? There's only a car park across the road. I just parked my car there. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's on, on level two, the cleaner's cupboard. You're joking. Not joking at all. And they weren't joking. I'd parked my car three bays down from where May East was. And it was just like a normal door at the back of this room. And you just put the key in the lock, and you open it. It was a simple, you could have used a screwdriver to open it. And then I was. There was May East, the center of the internet. Unbelievable, 1995. I mean, nowadays you couldn't get near it for no matter how hard you tried, but that's how things have come along in the last um, 20 years or so. So you do need thorough security like any other network data center. It needs to be a lot more serious. It needs to be accessible as well, easy, convenient for all operators to access. Um, you don't really want it such that only one provider can provide fiber <coughs> into there. Expandable location. Location, not under a staircase. Definitely not under a staircase. Underneath a staircase doesn't really expand very far. So, for example, the Thailand one, we're looking for a data center that's probably like 5,000 square feet. Um, because what happens is, even though you have one rack for the IX, ISPs bring routers in, and they go, ooh, this is quite a nice data center. Maybe I'll set up a small pop here. And this small pop grows, 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 because it's so accessible to the IX. Google turns up, Google Cache grow, 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 grow as well. You know, some of the ISPs in Thailand have got massive Google installations. And we're thinking, gosh, we move all these into the, where the IX is going to be, it's going to need a whole floor. So you do need to look at an expandable, expandable location. I mean, uh, Seattle IX is very clever. The whole data center there at the Western, it's next door to the Western Hotel in Seattle. The building beside it, the boring one, um, it's a total data center. It's one of the biggest data centers in the US. Um, the exchange point there is hosted for free by the, by the uh, building owner because the exchange point has bought so much business to um, their data center. They say, yeah, we'll provide you power. We'll give you all the rack space and everything else that you need and, and so on. So the Seattle exchange point costs nobody anything at all, nothing, totally free. There's no connection charge, no port charge. No, no charge or any description whatsoever because of very generous building owner and generous sponsors from the industry. So this is quite necessary as well. The management needs to be neutral. I mean, my favorite tends to be a consortium where you have a management board made up by the members. So it's just run by like a normal board. Um, you have elections every year or two, of new board members and, and so forth, representing all the participants. You, you don't want to end up in a situation where one or two of the participants run the IX for everybody else. Um, some exchanges are actually run separately, you know, where the members have agreed, right, these people can run it because we trust them. That's, that's kind of some of the models that people are using. But the main thing is they need to be neutral of any of the membership. And it's usually funded equally by the participants, so they have an annual membership fee. So you figure out what the membership fee is, and that covers the operating costs. You need to build in something to, if you need a new Ethernet switch, like every two, three years, you probably need a new switch. Uh, you need new interfaces, maintenance, and all the rest. Um, you need funding to, to cover that. Uh, make sure 24 by 7 cover is provided by the hosting location, and the consortium does all the management. Configuration, well, private address space of non-transit no added value service, well, that's unusual for an IX. Otherwise, public v4 slash 24 is enough for the exchange point LAN. That gives you up to 250 or so members, um, which most IXs are. Uh, v6 slash 64, that gives you 2 to the power of 64 members. I don't think there are even that many ISPs or people on the planet. 
So a slash 64 is more than enough for a, uh, the IX LAN. So you make a dual stack. There's no point doing V4 only these days. Sim make it simple dual stack. Exchange point doesn't need an AS number. The Ethernet switch can't run BGP. It's a layer 2 device. But the ISPs do need an AS. But that's very easy. Go to RIPE NCC or wherever and get your AS number that way. Network security, you need to be quite careful about configuring the LAN switch. You need to switch off all the, the services that you'd normally make use of in an enterprise network. Uh, it needs to be pretty securely configured. You don't want anybody to be able to get into this switch or do anything untoward. Um, layer 3 IX, already mentioned, marketing concept used by transit ISPs. There's no such thing as a Layer 3 IX. The real exchange point is an Ethernet switch open, neutral, free for anybody to connect to. Anything else is not. And there are lots of, there are lots of these marketing. I mean, gosh, there's so many. I go around Asia and I see, well, Thailand, did you know Thailand has eight internet exchange points? Well, it doesn't. They have eight domestic transit businesses that charge you for domestic traffic, but the regulator decided that they have to be called exchanges because they're exchanging traffic. Well, internet exchange point is not about exchanging traffic. Everybody exchanges traffic. My laptop is exchanging traffic with that wireless access point on the roof, but that does not make it an exchange point. So, it, right. Now, design considerations, bit more detail. Ethernet switch, it needs to be a managed switch. Don't even try and think of trying to set up an exchange with a cheap unmanaged switch. You get a managed switch now for a few hundred dollars, so that's you know, nothing at all. Most of reasonable security features, the EIX Working Group, that's the uh, RIPE Regions um, Exchange Point Working Group, has a switch wish list. It's quite old now. I don't know if it's been updated recently, but um, that gives more details about what an Ethernet switch ideally should have. There's a lot of things you want to be able to turn on, turn off, you know, Mac filtering, whatever else you might need on, on, the, on the ports of the switch. Um, Ethernet has pretty much superseded all other types of devices. So, you know, a 10100 switch, or well, even a 100-1000 switch is so cheap now. Each ISP brings a router. Router needs Ethernet port to connect to the switch and a WAN port to connect back to your network and needs to be able to run BGP. So you don't need anything fancy. You know, generally, the faster or the higher the traffic is, a one rack unit router is more than enough. You just need a faster and faster uh, fabric to handle the packets. Also, put the Ethernet switch in one rack. Generally, what, what you do with an exchange point is one rack is dedicated to the exchange. You put the switch in the middle uh, and put other equipment that's needed as well, other operational equipment. Don't put the, let the ISPs put the routers in there because then you can't secure the rack front and back. You get people poking around, and they could upset the whole switch. Routers from participant ISPs located in neighboring adjacent racks, so they might choose to set up their own POP in the data center, in which case you just run the fiber from wherever they are. Um, use copper, use fiber, whatever. Each one needs to run BGP. They need their own AS number, so a public AS number, not a private one. I mean, I've dealt with exchange points, as I said earlier, running RIP, for goodness sake, uh, or trying to use a private AS number for all the participants. Um, Trying to convert all those to using public AS numbers is not as straightforward as it may seem. Um, it's quite a lot of work converting from private to public. And as I said before lunch, we have 4,000 million AS numbers. So one AS number for every two people on the planet. So there's no shortage of AS numbers. So please don't use private ASNs for exchanges. Um, eBGP configured either with all participants or a subset. It's more likely to be with a subset. The very few exchange points you can go to where everybody has an open peering policy. So the types of peering you can get, mandatory multilateral peering called MMLP, where you're forced to peer with everybody. There are a couple of IXs who do this. Uh, one of them is doing OK because the ISPs are actually all very small. The other one, which is uh, trying to be a very big one is a disaster, total and utter disaster. Um, people who have tried MMLP over the years, I mean, it never worked at the start. It's still not working now. But people keep wanting to do MMLP. It's usually a regulator comes in and says, everybody will peer with everybody. But unfortunately, you can't expect an internet cafe who's a customer of a mid-sized ISP 
to be able to peer with the upstream, their upstream's uh, transfer, their ISP's transit provider. It doesn't work like that. People peer with people who are equivalent in size according to their business. Multilateral peering is quite common. This is where people have an open peering policy. So what they generally focus with an open peering policy will peer with something called a route server that's put up at the exchange. So they announce all the routes to the route server and the route server distributes all the routes to everybody else who peers with the route server. So I'll talk about the route server later. This is quite common. Uh, bilateral peering is common, especially at the big, more the regional exchange points, more have bilateral peering because you get multinational regional providers turning up as well as little ones. And of course, little ISPs are not going to get peering from the multinationals because the multinationals go, who are you down there? Oh, you're my customer. Right? And they won't peer with the customers. So that's why bilateral peering, more bilateral is more when people have closed peering policies or selective peering policies um, where they want to choose who they peer with. So generally you find that exchange points will have a route server. Some people will peer with a route server, others will not. And so the ones who won't, you have to approach directly. For the routing, well, we've talked about this this morning. Border routers to the exchange must not be configured with default route to carry the full routing table. Potential for abuse, so carrying default or full table means that this router could be used um, for uh, outbound traffic from non-peering participants. The correct configuration is only to carry the routes offered to the exchange point peers on the exchange point peering router. So it's generally your own aggregate prefixes and the prefixes from your customers. Some ISPs offer transit across the exchange point fabrics. Some exchange points have rules that say you cannot provide transit. But how you'd enforce that without looking at packets, I don't know. So some ISPs do this, but be on your guard because of because you're providing transit means you've got the full BGP table or default route there. And that means you're open to abuse by people who do not peer with you. Um, yeah, ISP border routers at the exchange point should not be configured to carry the exchange point LAN within the IGP or the IBGP. So this is just next top self, again, to try and protect from people pushing traffic through you who shouldn't. Um, don't generate ISP aggregates in the peering router. If connection from the backbone goes down, then of course, what happens if you generate the aggregate in the peering router, it's still an answer to the exchange point. So your exchange point peers still see your router as the best path. Your backup will be through your upstream, so the incoming packets to your upstream and, their, and your peers at the exchange will work just fine. But the return path, best path to your exchange point router. And of course, the packets will get dropped right there. As for address space, some exchanges use private address space. Uh, the theory being public address space means the exchange point network could be leaked to the internet, which could be undesirable. Because, you know, they work on the basis that most ISPs are filtering private address space. But I mean, the downside is then your trace routes all look weird. You've got where you go to the exchange point line is all nothing. So that's probably not a great great solution. Actually, it doesn't solve the problem. It just does what all private address space does, hide it, hide the problem. Most exchange points use public address space. When the, the registries all have policies that give address space to internet exchange points. So make use of that. Um, use public addresses, the routing doesn't get, well, the trace routes don't get messed up, which means troubleshooting becomes easier. Um, Typically now, exchange points are both a dual stack, the v4, v6. So when you connect, you get a v4 and a v6 address for your router. Now, the exchanges themselves don't need AS numbers because Ethernet switch is a layer 2 device, doesn't run BGP. Some exchanges have what's called a route collector, which I'll talk about later. Others have a route server, some have both. Collector on the server runs in private AS. It's not visible to the world. It's only visible on the exchange point, so it can sit in a private AS. Some exchanges have common good services, which usually require internet transit, which means that the exchange point needs a transit router. So you have a transit router, and behind that um, sits the services that the exchange point is providing. And of course, this transit router needs a public AS number, and it needs public address space as well. So I'll show you this in a bit. 
Mixing port speeds less of an issue these days. Um, I mean, Ethernet switches now are generally 10, 100, 1000 by default. So mixing sports, port speeds is not so much an issue. Again, this is not an issue either. ATM is gone. Um, but in the days of the DEC giga switches migrating to ATM and to Ethernet, having these three mediums on one box caused issues with buffering and, and so forth on, on the switches. Insist that the exchange point participants bring their own router. That moves the buffering problem off the exchange point. Ethernet switches tend not to have very big buffers. Um, they've only got a few millisecond or a few hundred millisecond buffer space. And so if you end up with long haul links from the exchange point back to the ISP's router, you could start losing packets pretty severely. So make sure they bring the router to the exchange physically, even if it's somewhere else in the building. Make sure that it's um, very close by. Charging. Exchange points need to be run at minimal cost to the members. So common examples, data center host the exchange for free, that's the Seattle model. Exchange point operates cost recovery um, and there's different pricing for different ports. I mean operating cost recovery is very common. Commercial exchanges, um, they operate cost recovery as well but they make money. I mean they do actually make profits. They've got, they pay the staff they have shareholders, they give dividends to shareholders as well. But, you know, the, again, the risk with the commercial exchange is somebody could set up operating purely cost recovery and undercut the prices. So, you know, an exchange point should not be a competition between different um, exchange operators. So it's really got to be there for the benefit of everybody. IXs don't charge for traffic crossing the switch fabric. I know of some exchanges which charge for the actual traffic. They sit on the Ethernet switch and look at the packet count in the port and work out averages and send ISPs invoices. There's one exchange which actually it costs more to send traffic across the exchange point than it is to buy international transit out of the country. So in that exchange point, the operator doesn't understand why it's not doing very well, but for me it's very simple arithmetic. Why would you pay a huge amount of money to send local traffic when you can pay a tenth of the price to send it via London? I know the round trip times don't make a lot of sense, but financially it makes no sense to use this particular uh, IX. Right? So don't charge for traffic, you charge for the physical contribution towards the <coughs> infrastructure. So here with the data center hosting the IX, they provide the switch and supporting infrastructure, the operator cover, because they benefit from the business that the IX members and the customers bring to the data center. That's why they do it. The exchange point is so little cost for them to do because they make so much money out of all the other hosting. It's a very nice model. It's very idealistic, really, but it's a very nice model. And they benefit from the prestige of hosting the IX and its ancillary services. Um, I mean, generally when we're trying to set up new IXs, this is the model we always push people towards. Find a data center who's feeling a little bit generous because they're going to benefit from all the business. But it doesn't really work out that way. What we tend to find, it heads off in this direction. Each member pays a flat annual fee towards the IX membership. And this flat fee is a share in the cost of the switch and the Ethernet ports, cost of the operator cover, so the remote hands, the data center costs like power, air conditioning, and everything else they need, cost of the membership association, because normally setting up a member association has some cost with it, you know, whether it's you know, your business, um, your government business, whatever department is called, they have their annual fee to keep your business registered, you know, your tax issues and finance and all, all the rest. And there's a contingency needed for new equipment and upgrades. I mean, you will need to replace the switch every two, three years um, just to keep up with the traffic. I mean, a switch will last forever, but a five-year-old Ethernet switch is going to be pretty out of date. And this total annual cost is shared equally amongst members. So more members, the lower the cost. So these sort of IXs are very keen to get more members because it reduces the cost for everybody. And there's also differential pricing by port. Um, member pays according to the port speed they require because what you find is that you know, let's say one line card could handle 400 gig e ports. Well, those line cards like a million dollars each. So expecting a member who's come along for a gig ethernet connection to share the cost of one of these line cards is highly unrealistic. Um, 
or one line card could handle 24 10 gig or 96 1 gig ports. So what you do is you work out the pricing. If you want a 10 gig connection, you pay X. If you want a 100 gig connection, you pay, well, six times X. And if you want a 1 gig connection, you just pay a quarter of X. That's the sort of pricing you would look at. So you pay towards the cost of the line card, the port that you use. So the relative port cost is passed on to the participants plus a share of the cost in the switch. This is the model that NetNod uses for their exchanges in Sweden. And they've got three or four exchanges in different parts of Sweden, and that's the model they use. So yeah, if you have a one gig connection, you want to upgrade, you can buy two one gig connections, or you pay for a 10 gig connection. The 10 gig connection is probably four times the one gig connection. I don't know their actual prices, but that's my guess at what it would be. So that's the sort of thing that you see some exchanges um, doing. So the different types of charging model, but it's pretty much charging for the actual um, infrastructure. Services offered. Don't do web hosting at the IX. In other words, exchange point shouldn't do web hosting. Get, other, get the content providers to come and do the web hosting for you. You don't want to do anything that competes with what the members are doing. Performance stats, you know, we use tools like Cacti, Observium to put the IX throughput graphs up. You find all exchange points will have a public website where you see the traffic graphs because they all want to show off how big the IX is. Well, you remember, I mean, earlier in the week, UEIX and talking about some of that and some of, oh, look what all the graphs are doing because they want to show how big and how important the exchange point is. Um, what else is useful? CCTLD, DNS, very common at internet exchanges where the operator of the country uh, top level domain will pick up the servers, well, not pick them up literally, but they'll put one server at the IX. It gives very ready access to all the participants in the country. So .se, for example, is hosted at NetNode IXs. Um, and in fact, you know, NAD not operate the iRoute, and the iRoute is in many different parts of the world, so they bring a lot of top-level domain um, name servers um, to the different iRoutes that they operate. Any cast instances of <coughs> iRoute, FRoute servers are present at many IXs as well. Not only those, there's LRoute and KRoute are also popping up at many exchange points also. Again, having the root name servers present there means very low latency for DNS lookup, for the initial lookup, which just speeds the overall internet experience for, for users. Usenet News, I think, is gone now. Well, I mean, it's still around, but I don't know how many people waste their time with it. Um, right Collector shows the reachability information. Uh, I'll talk about that next. Route servers used for distributing prefixes from folks who've got open, open peering policies. Looking Glass is one way of making the route collector routes available for global view. For example, traceroute.org um, is a collection of many um, of these looking glasses that you can go to and see what your prefix looks like to help with troubleshooting. Content redistribution, caching, you've got the Google Global Cache, you've got Akamai Update Distribution Servers, very, very common. Broadcast media love being at exchange point. You'll see you know, the BBC, CNN, and all these folks love popping up at exchange points. It simply means they don't have to pay for transit to get to your user's eyes. Um, they can usually get their own infrastructure there and then peer with you at the IX. Network time protocol I mentioned already. So you get a GPS receiver, atomic clock you can usually buy from various places plug it in at the IX and provide an accurate time source for your users. Routing registry, some of them run there, the New Zealand exchange points, um, or have a routing registry, the NZRS, um, where all the routing policy for the ISPs is registered. So new address space appears, put in the routing registry, everybody automatically configures. Um, what else? OK, looking at the route collector. Usually a router or Unix system running BGP gathers routing information, peers with each ISP. So generally, you set up the route collector. It doesn't need to be a big router as long as it's got the ability to handle BGP with all the members. So you know a small 1RU Cisco or Juniper router is usually enough. It doesn't forward packets. It doesn't announce any prefixes. It's simply there 
to provide access to a looking glass so that people can see what routes are available at the exchange point. And it's useful for the exchange point members to use for troubleshooting as well. You, know, you can check your filters, are you announcing prefixes? Well, if they click to see them, then, well, all the peers should see them too. Um, and it's useful for, for prospective members, so the exchange point consortium can advertise the prefixes that they have, and I mentioned troubleshooting. So it literally fits in like this. You've got the ISPs participating in the exchange, and you put the route collector in, just as a simple router sitting in the rack next to the switch. As I say, it could be a router, it could be a Unix system. Oh, man, I've always used a router because they fit and forget. Unix systems you have to maintain, a bit more of a pain. Router's just pretty much done. Um, it peers eBGP with every exchange point member, so part of the membership agreement is that you agree to peer with the right collector. Uh, accepts everything, gives nothing, uses a private AS, connects to the exchange point transit LAN, so it just sits on the exchange point. Um, the back end connection, um, that's a second Ethernet which is globally routed, and that can be used for connection to the website and, and so forth. Most exchanges I know have a route collector of some description. It's a very good PR tool. It lets folks see what's available at the exchange. And it's very, very simple. Route servers, very similar to a route collector, but it also announces prefixes. So it collects all the prefixes from the neighbors, but it also announces prefixes to the exchange point members. So rather than exchange point members having to set up a large number of BGP sessions, they set up BGP session just with the route server, and then they get all the prefixes known at the IX. So it helps scale the routing for really large exchange points, and you find the bigger exchange points all have route servers in them. Even some of the small ones have route servers. It's again, it's a simple one RU box, put it in, set it up, and it's there if people want to use it. All right, so it simplifies the routing processes, um, optional participation, of course. Um, it's not a mandatory service. Exchange point operator is a facilitator, not a lawmaker. So it's optional participation. If you have a traditional router, it will result in the route server autonomous system number appearing in the path, which may not be awfully useful. Although the latest Cisco iOS has a route server client configuration, actually can do route server, um, and so it will strip out the AS path, so you won't see the, the autonomous system there. But the idea is basically this. This is your full mesh EVGP at the exchange point. Um, so the more peers you add, well, of course, the more dense the mesh. And that gets a bit hard to handle, so this is more optimal, where each member of the IX peers, say, with a couple of route servers for redundancy. And that way, um, well, yes, it scales the EVGP mesh. The downside is you're, you're dependent totally on the two route servers. So if they break, you have no... Um, eBGP at all. So that's why they're optional. If you want to use them, you can use them. What you tend to find is that ISPs will use them to get with all the open peering policy members, and then they'll have direct bilateral peering with those that are selective or closed. So you get the two best of both worlds. All right, so notice route servers only affects routing information flow. Traffic flow still runs directly on the Ethernet LAN. It doesn't run through the route server. I see some people go, oh, I need the biggest router possible for the route server. No, you don't. When I run a route, I've run route server on a Dynamips emulation on my laptop. Works perfectly well. And that only does a few hundred packets per second before my laptop stops working. So, no, this, this just needs to be able to talk BGP, and that's it. So it doesn't need to be fancy at all. Um, scales the eBGP mesh, help, mesh helps scale prefix distribution separates routing and forwarding, and just generally makes things very easy. Disadvantage of using a route server is you, that the ISPs can use direct policy control. That's the downside. That's when you end up with mandatory multilateral peering. You're forced to peer with a route server. Then you've got no policy control. And that's really not good at all. You want to be able to decide who you peer with. If there's somebody at the IX you don't want to have a business relationship with, you should not be forced to peer with them. So don't peer with them at, through the route server. They won't peer with it either. Um, possible insertion of the route server AS into the routing path, as I said earlier. Typical usage, 
optional service, most common at large exchanges, Lynx, Torix, M6, whatever. Um, ISPs peer directly with significant peers and with Route Server for the rest. Implementations, well, Linux, FreeBSD, you can run Baird, Quagga, Open, PGPD. I'm sure there are other BGP software that you can run as well. Router, you can use any router you want, but it has the Route Server AS in the AS path. Cisco IOS 15.2 and XE 3.7 has got this configuration in it. So if you're using modern Cisco, um, you can have a Route Server client, and that will work the same way as the public domain implementations. So it's quite nice after about 10 years of campaigning to actually see this appear in iOS. So I, I know a couple of exchange points that are using um, a Cisco 7200 router, a very old one, as the route server. Works perfectly fine. Um, so would the route server benefit you? Helpful when BGP knowledge is limited, but it's not an excuse not to learn BGP. Avoids having to maintain a large number of peers. Some people just can't be bothered doing it, or the exchanges that you're at are so big that trying to maintain 200 peers is, is too much work. Right, what can go wrong? Well, things that can go wrong. Some ISPs attempt to cash in on the reputation of exchanges, so they market the internet transit services as exchange points. We're exchanging packets, so we're an exchange point. That was a classic email response I got from somebody I was asking a few years ago. Um, well, exchanging packets does not make you an exchange point. Exchange point is blah, 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 as I said before. The so-called layer three exchanges, they're really internet transit providers. They have a router, they connect to your router, you pay for traffic through their exchange point. As soon as you pay for traffic, you don't have an exchange point. Um, routers are used rather than a switch. The most famous example, that's the one that started the whole mess about a layer three exchange, was the Singtel IX. And it's not an exchange, as I said, it's, a, it's the Singapore domestic transit provider. Um, financial things can go wrong badly. Some IXPs price the exchange point out of the means of most providers. It's meant to encourage local peering. It's meant to be the cheapest way of, for ISPs to interconnect. Um, so the only acceptable charging model is cost recovery. Right? That's the only acceptable charging model. If you can persuade the data center operator to give the IX for free, even better. But some exchanges decide to charge for port traffic and as soon as they're doing that, they end up competing with the members because you have members who also charge transit services and they can probably do it cheaper and better than the IX can. Of course, there's nothing wrong with charging different flat fees for the different types of ports you're connecting to. But once you start charging for the traffic, then you become a commercial ISP. Another one, I won't mention Paris, but I just did. Too many exchange points in one locale. When you end up with seven exchange points in one city, well, which one do you go to? All of them? It ends up costing you just as much money. <coughs> so it becomes very expensive to try and connect to all of them. So they don't or they won't, and local traffic suffers defeating the viability of the IXs. I mean, again, if I look in Bangkok and Thailand, we've got eight of these exchanges all run, well, the domestic transit businesses run by the eight uh, ISPs with international gateway licenses um, and it becomes very expensive for everybody to connect so they aren't all connected to each other so it's quite often traffic from one ISP to another ISP in Thailand goes via the US or Singapore or Hong Kong or London or whatever so having too many ideally one exchange point is all you really need for a location definition of a location I don't know I mean, we could pick Kuwait here. One exchange point here is all that's really needed. Um, not a competition, not a profit-making business. Rules and restrictions. Tries to compete with a membership offering services that the ISPs would offer. In reality, exchanges are operated by the members for the members. <coughs> Run it as a closed privilege club. Restrictive membership criteria. In reality, all the participant needs to have is an AS number and their own independent address space. That's all they need. Exchange point loca located in a data center with restricted physical and transmission access. But all the exchange point really ne needs to be is a neutral interconnect in a neutral location. Must be no barrier to entry. Charges for traffic. Charging for traffic, well, transit providers do this as well. 
That could be another rule or restriction. IXP providing access to end users rather than just network operators and service providers. Yeah, sure, bring your, your, bring your Windows laptop and plug it in here. That'll be perfectly fine. You don't want to do that. You want a network operator. They must have their own address and their own AS number, preferably with their own transit arrangement as well. Interfering with member business decisions, mandatory multilateral peering is the biggest interference, and the exchanges that have tried it have failed. Technical errors, interconnecting exchange points. This comes up all the time. I mean, my goodness, how often have we talked about um, the Asia region IX, this grand plan of connecting all the exchange points in Asia together? And everybody says, yeah, yeah, this is going to be such a good thing to do. And then somebody says, um, who's going to pay? Oh, well, governments will pay. And then when the governments approach, they say, really? Why are we going to do that? There already are commercial operators providing connectivity between all these countries. Why should we do it? And so it gets talked about a regional interconnected IX thing simply doesn't work. Um, there are only two exchanges I know that are interconnected. One in Milan and another one in the Alps on the French border. They're interconnected because they have common language and common everything else. Traffic between the two regions would normally go via Amsterdam or Frankfurt or somewhere. So it kind of made sense to join the two because there was no ISP connecting the two. But that's the only one I know that actually seems to work. Everything else, fail. Bridging the exchange point line back to the office. Oh, we're so poor, we can't afford a router. Yes, well, I remember from the links. Um, why has a line disappeared? Hopefully it will reappear. Yeah. So the financial benefits cost way more than the cost of a router. I mean, I remember from the links of seeing Windows um, NetBIOS requests appearing in the links line. I was like, hmm, where do they come from? because one of the original ISPs had bridged the LAN back to their building, back to their office, and they're connecting their PCs and so on onto the actual links um, LAN. Don't want that. So make sure nobody bridges it out of the building. Um, what else? Route server implemented from day one. I've seen a lot of things of, you know, somebody comes in from overseas and because the, the locals say, oh, well, you know, we don't really know BGP. And the guy comes in and says, OK, don't worry about it. I'll do it all for you. I'll set up this route server, put this configuration on your router, and it'll all just work like magic, and I'll fly off. That's happened a lot as well. Not the way forward. It's better for folks to understand how BGP works, given it's actually quite simple. Um, yes, use the route server to help scale. It's not an alternative to running BGP. And also, the route server can't really be run by committee either. So it's there to help scale the exchange point, not be a replacement for doing BGP. Um, another one that was hilarious as well, I've seen uh, pop up a couple of times in Africa, is using a route reflector. Here it's like, oh, the ISPs aren't running BGP. So the exchange point operator says, right, I'm going to run IBGP. Give me the passwords to all your routers. And I'll run a great big IBGP with all your routers, and I've got all the access. So it means the exchange point operator is using a route reflector. Okay, it distributes routes. But then the ISPs lose access to their own infrastructure. They've got somebody else with uh, login and configure passwords. Uh, it means the exchange point operator has to know BGP, and the ISPs don't know what's going on. Really, absolutely do not go down this path. Unraveling an exchange point that's had this put onto it um, ask, ask the folks at the Kenya exchange point, because they started off in the route reflector path, and it took Michuki Mwangi about, I don't know how many months to unravel the whole thing. It was really hard. Right? He didn't want to end up having to run all the BGP for all the ISPs there. I mean, the claimed advantage was, oh yeah, it was going to allow the exchange point to start very quickly. Uh, well, very quick start exchange point, rack, Ethernet switch, plug yourself in. I mean, how much harder can that be? Setting up an IBGP mesh and getting access to everybody's routers, and what you do with the usernames and passwords and all the rest. It's just too complicated. Um, claimed advantage. Exchange per operator has full control over IXP activities. Well, do you want to have full control over all the ISP networks as well? What if one ISP is broken into by another ISP? Who do you blame? 
and so forth. It's ISP participants suffer because they surrender control of the border router and the routing and peering policy. And the exchange point operator becomes a single point of failure as well. If they're not available, something breaks while well, you stay broken until it can be fixed. Migration from this to a proper route server setup is highly non-trivial because you're each ISP border router is sitting in the exchange point AS, you've got to migrate it out, you've got to put and set up new peering sessions and all the rest. I mean, helping Michuki get this right, oh my God, goodness, it took us quite some time to sort out. More information, well, you know, acceptable use policy, minimum rules for connection, so setting up an exchange point association, get some minimum rules together. We talked about fees already, try to keep them as minimum as possible. Don't point a fault route to anybody. Beware of third party next stop. You may get traffic running between people you don't peer with because one of your peers is passing your traffic onwards. Only announce your aggregates, so read RIPE 399 and RIPE 532 next. 399 is for V4, 532 is for V6, but how to do announcements. Filter the peerings. You remember the multi-homing presentation this morning about how to peer at exchange points. So make sure you filter inbound and outbound. There are many examples. I don't know why I bothered to put this slide in, but there are many, many examples of exchange points around the world. Um, features, multiple switches, of course, UPS generators, same as you do for your normal ISP backbone. 24 by 7 cover for the building, DNS, route, collector server, content caches, NTP, CCTLD, root servers, Google cache, Akamai, whatever. Location I mentioned already. Neutral, secure, accessible, public address for the peering LAN, public address for the services LAN, AS number needed for the route collector, so private for that, public ASN if you have any exchange point services you want to be visible around the world. Route servers to help scale it, gather statistics, observing is so simple to set up. I even managed to do it by myself, which I was completely stunned about, having struggled with cacti and all the others before. Um, and it can gather stats from all these ports on the switch, display them on a nice website, and you can make that available for all the members. EuroIX is interesting. Um, it's the, not an exchange point, but it's the consortium of European exchanges. So they have meetings every, I think it's every six months. So all the exchange points in Europe get together in some location. They talk about a lot of the technology and operational best practices and design and so forth for exchanges. And um, they have, well, they don't have members outside of Europe, but they have associate members. So if, if you're interested in getting an IX going or know of somebody who is, EuroIX is interested in helping, um, providing technical advice or guidance and so forth. Um, I mean, when I was at Cisco, I was, um, Cisco was one of the supporters of EuroIX, so I went to several of the meetings, and it was very well worth it, um, just getting support and assistance from other exchanges. PCH have got a lot of collections about papers and you know a lot of the political and business papers. I've stuck to most of the technical things here, but they've got a lot of the business side of it and political side of it as well. Telegeography, well, you know, they do an internet exchange point map. Pretty much anybody who says I'm an exchange point ends up on their map. Um, so you pretty I think according to them, every country in the world has an IX, which we know is obviously not true. So, but again, it's interesting resource to see where the interconnections are happening. Layer 2 IX, universally deployed, the cores and Ethernet switch, ATM, everything else is gone. Layer 3 is just marketing by wholesale ISPs. Um, doesn't have the same flexibility, neutrality, or effectiveness as Layer 2. So don't put a router in the middle. It just becomes a very, very big point of failure and very, very hard to actually manage. As I say, the only one that ever was a router that kind of worked was um, Kix. HKX in its early days was a router as well, a Cisco 7500, became a Catalyst 6500 with a routing blade in it. Um, that got totally overloaded, so it's very much an Ethernet switch these days. And that's pretty much all I have. Um, managed to finish just two minutes late. So I hope that was useful. I won't say it's completely comprehensive. I'm sure I've missed something else out, but it's certainly, I hope it's useful to cover um, internet exchange point 
uh, design, very much on the technical side. Um, if anyone here is interested in getting an IX going, while well, there are loads and loads of people who, who can offer help, I'm happy to offer my help as well. Um, and good luck in your endeavors. Anyway, thank you all very much. Hope you've enjoyed it. We'll have a tea break now, and after the tea break, Marco and Max are going to be talking about kickstarting V6 deployment. And next door, Alex is talking about RPKI. And that's us. Thank you, folks. <laughs>